Good evening, everyone. Call the meeting to order at 6.04 p.m. And I'd like to humbly acknowledge this land which we live, learn, work, and play. It's Treaty 8 territory, the traditional lands of Cree and Dene, and unceded territory of the Métis. And for the record, we have Councillor Walkwin participating via Teams, joining us shortly. Um, and if, if anyone in attendance wishes to address Council on today's Draper flood mitigation matter, if you haven't registered with the Legislative Services, we encourage you to do so now. Um, registered delegates are permitted up to five minutes to speak and must remain on topic. Our item of business today is the Draper Flood Mitigation Report. I'd like to call on Kelly Hansen, Director of Strategic Planning and Program Management, and Brad McMurdo, Director of Planning and Development. Thank you, Mayor Bowen. Well, <clears throat> everyone gets settled in. I just wanted to set some of the context for this evening before the presentation is brought forward. Uh, of course, as Council and the public are aware, we have just one item on the agenda tonight that is uh, looking at uh, Draper flood mitigation. And I think as everyone knows, uh, this is a very uh, complex topic. And added to that complexity are a number of other issues that have been identified in the community, uh, both that have just come forward from members of the community, but also through the engagements that we've been doing uh, these are also uh, important, and we're committed to looking into them and dealing with them. I think for this evening, however, they are uh, considered to be secondary, and we need to focus our energy on establishing a clear approach uh, to flood mitigation in Draper. In fact, I think many of those issues and concerns uh, will have uh, clearer solutions uh, that will uh, help be identified once we have clear direction on flood mitigation. Uh, as I said, it's a complex topic, and though I've been here for a relatively short time, I know there's a lot of history to it, um, a lot of uh, conversations, a lot of things said and done or not done. Uh, the Chamber, of course, is the place for civic discussion and debate, and uh, I expect there can be disagreement at times, and it's important, I think, that we all work to maintain expectations of, of civil debate. And I uh, often, in the past, have pointed to our artwork in the in the room and the seven sacred teachings, and I think they are quite appropriate for this evening as well in, in, uh, as our guide. So uh, I think working together on this, we can be successful in council coming to a clear direction. Um, I do think this is a real significant opportunity to create some clarity on flood mitigation for Draper and all residents for the first time in a very long time. Uh, so I think I encourage everyone to focus on that discussion and, uh, and look for council for some clear direction. Just before I turn it over, I'd really want to express my thanks to administration for all the efforts in bringing this together. This has been very much a multi-departmental effort uh, led by the individuals that you see before you this evening, but there's been lots of input across the organization. We also have a number of subject matter experts in the room um, that can help in responding to questions as we have them. So. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Hansen, Mr. McMurdo, and uh, off we go. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Kelly Hansen, Director of Strategic Planning and Program Management. I'm here this evening presenting with my colleague, Brad McMurdo, Director of Planning and Development. We're accompanied by various subject matter experts related to the topic of flood mitigation. Included within the public package is the Draper Flood Mitigation Overview Report. Myself and Brad are gonna take time to walk through the sections of the report, answer questions, and collectively discuss administration's recommendations related to the path forward for the community of Draper. We recognize this is a difficult topic. As we assess the options, we considered the impacts from a community perspective and considered the impacts for individuals and families. This was at the forefront of our thought as we develop these recommendations. Currently outlined on the screen is an overview of this evening's presentation. However, in the interest of framing our conversation and to support shared understanding, we'd like to highlight our administrative recommendation at both the start and close of this presentation. As such, administration rec administration's recommendation is that flood accommodation be approved as the flood mitigation option for the community of Draper, and that administration bring forward a household flood risk reduction grant program for eligible properties within the community of Draper 
by March 14th, 2023. At a high level, flood accommodation recognizes that flooding will occur periodically in developed areas with measures taken to limit, mitigate, or reduce vulnerability to flood with appropriate investments made in proportion to the risk. The second recommendation introduces a grant program, Household Flood Risk Reduction. This is complementary to the concept of flood accommodation. The grant program would seek to provide funds to incorporate flood resilient considerations at a household level that could reduce the impact and expedite recovery while recognizing everyday livability and quality of life. Having shared our recommendations, we'll begin moving forward through the, through the overview. The community of Draper is a rural community constructed adjacent to the Clearwater River. In total, the community has 98 privately owned parcels, and as per the 2021 census, the community has 60 dwellings, which houses 132 residents. The size of the individual lots, the size and style of homes, the distance of homes from each other, and their proximity to the river, as well as the relatively low population density spread out across the community are some of its unique attributes. The chronological summary of the municipality's decisions and intergovernmental relations are outlined on this slide. This is not intended to be a fulsome history of the community of Draper. Instead, it opens in 2020 post flooding events as this served as a catalyst for present day Draper flood mitigation analysis, community engagement and residents request to know the municipality's path forward with respect to mitigation for Draper. The most recent sequence of events is from September 26, 2022, where Premier Kenny reiterated the position of municipal affairs and environment and parks and definitively stated, there are currently no provincial or federal grants available for the relocation of residents at Draper at this time. And likewise, there is no funding or programs available to fund flood mitigation. The next three slides present maps, which we'll reference throughout the conversation this evening. While we move through them relatively quickly on the screen, they have been included in the online agenda package for continued reference, if helpful. The maps are color coded to represent the property specific main floor elevation as it relates to the one in, one, one in 40 year, one in 100 year, or one in 200 year flooding elevation levels. The maps were created using community survey data, which was completed in 2021. The next slides will provide an overview from the perspective of provincial, federal government, regional context, and ongoing resident engagement. In addition to the most recent correspondence from the government of Alberta, where they definitively confirmed that funding and or programs to proactively approach flood mitigation for the community of Draper are not currently available, the government of Alberta has also recently changed the format of Disaster Recovery Program, or DRP for short. The DRP program adjustments reflect a shift of disaster recovery costs to municipalities and property owners. As such, the same level of DRP funding will not be available to cover costs incurred by either the municipality or residents for future disaster. And it's important that the municipality consider this as we make decisions related to the community of Draper. How we approach this policy shift becomes more and more important over time. We are not only considering the next flood, a flood event, we are asking council to make a decision that will position the municipality well into the future. The government of Alberta's changes to DRP in 2021 have made it so that financial assistance can only be provided one time per property for all eligible natural disasters and financial assistance will not be provided to future applicants who own the property at the same physical location. This means DRP would only be available for one future event. Regionally, following the 2020 flood, the municipality has taken steps to increase community and individual resilience in flood affected communities. This has included a combination of structural flood mitigation, temporary and permanent, buyouts, home raising, grant programs, and underground infrastructure improvements in the downtown, waterways, and Ptarmigan Court. The community of Draper is different than downtown waterways and Ptarmigan Court in a number of ways that make it more difficult to apply the same types of flood mitigation measures. 
as the municipality's approach to flood mitigation is informed by the need to protect public assets, the community of Draper has to date been excluded from the structural flood mitigation program based on limited public assets within the community. Flood accommodation is, an appropri is appropriate for the community of Draper with consideration for the limited public infrastructure, the complexity and cost prohibitive nature of structural mitigation and the government of Alberta's position that there is no provincial or federal funding available for flood mitigation or the relocation of residents of Draper. The municipality has committed to and needs to provide a decision to the residents of Draper on the next steps. Since 2020 flood, administration has engaged with Draper residents regarding flood mitigation and opportunities to increase resiliency. Draper property owners have divergent views on short and long-term flood mitigation due to the personal nature of this conversation and direct correlation to their day-to-day -day household finances and the fact that these properties are the place they call home and make memories. And because for many people, purchasing a home is the single largest expenditure they will ever make. Public engagement sessions indicated there is no consensus on a preferred path forward. However, residents continue to highlight the importance of a decision. Brad is going to speak to the options that have been, cons been considered for the community of Draper. As you listen to these options, it's important to think about what we're calling foundational considerations. There are many interrelated factors that have been have a bearing on the Draper flood mitigation and they should be considered for all options considered for the community. On the subsequent slides, you'll hear an overview of the interrelated factors, methodology and mitigation options. There are several interrelated factors as discussed that affect council's decision for flood mitigation. I'll list a few that would be highlighted. Other levels of government have shifted their approach to national natural disaster recovery and are communicating that they're limiting their funding at a household and community level. Should the municipality take on the vacated role, perceived or real, that other governments are no longer filling, it will be setting resident expectations in advance of future flood events and the municipality would be supporting the responsibilities that have historically been supported by other levels of government. Continued investment of capital infrastructure needs to be considered differently while continuing to find ways to ensure service delivery to Draper is maintained or improved. The direction of the municipality takes on flood mitigation in Draper will inform the development of the new Draper area structure plan. The ASP will provide direction for how new developments should occur in the community and the proposed land use bylaw will support the ASP policies. The community is served by one road for access and egress, Draper Road. When water levels reach 248.5 meters to 248.7 meters, all residents would be presumably within an evacuation area. With these foundational considerations, I'll now provide you with an overview of the methodology we use to evaluate the options that we're presenting this evening. To determine the options that administration has developed for council's consideration, our departments hosted cross-departmental tabletop exercises, liaised with industry partners, and continued conversations related to insurance insurability in the flood areas. A resident-focused house-specific approach was utilized to assess the options at a household property level, sub-community level, for example, multiple properties near one another, and at the level of the entire Draper community. The following is a sample of some of the information that informed our process. Evaluation and review of each municipal property file, which provided insight to the specifics of each property, environmental considerations, property survey, resident engagement, provincial flood mapping, provincial development requirements, property assessment values, estimated cost for reclamation and demolition. I'll now pass this over to Brad, who will walk us through the options and the associated considerations. Thank you, Kelly. As previously mentioned, administration examined options in two categories, those being structural and non-structural mitigation. Treatment options for structural mitigation included temporary and permanent berms, which were further assessed at the community, sub-community, and property-specific level. The last structural option considered was the notion of raising homes so that the main floor, specifically the underside of the floor joists, would be at or above the 250 meter, 250.9 meter elevation. 
Treatment options for non-structural mitigation include flood accommodation, which is the recommended approach. In addition, for consideration this evening, is, a, is, the, is the potential for a household flood, redu flood re risk reduction grant that would complement the recommended approach, thereby allowing some residents to take steps to make property specific improvements to reduce property damage and post flood impacts. Other non-structural mitigation options explored include voluntary buyouts as well as mandatory buyouts. Before I begin, it is important to note that through the assessment of the following options, administration considered the appropriateness of speaking to residents on a one-on-one -on -one basis as it is anticipated that some of the costs of the mitigation options were deemed to be not financially feasible and therefore not aligned with council's strategic plan. I will now begin to explain treatment options in more detail, starting with structural mitigation. The following are general considerations for all berms. The municipality does not invest or construct assets on land that it does not own. Therefore, if the municipality were to consider building berms, land acquisition would be required. This could necessitate mandatory buyouts of properties and homes in order to accommodate the structural mitigation. Approvals from other levels of government will be required, such as Provincial Water Act approval. The municipality is not able to obtain regulatory approvals for assets or projects located on land that it does not own. Therefore, the property owners or designated contractor would need to ob obtain their own regulatory approvals if they constructed berms within their own properties. It should be noted that what one property is proposing to do may impact the options available to an abutting property. And so a collaborative approach would be necessary among property owners. Provincial regulations require a 30 meter and uh, 90 foot development buffer from the Clearwater River. Any exceptions would require studies and an application to the government of Alberta seeking to reduce the buffer. With respect to permanent berms to ensure safe and stable mitigation, the slope of the berm use cannot be less than three to one. Berms for the community of Draper must appreciate the proximity to private property and the 30 meter setback from the Clearwater River. The municipality structural flood mitigation approach was planned and focuses on protection of municipal infrastructure. Administration has determined that permanent and or temporary berms at the community level is not practical for the following reasons. There is insufficient municipally owned land for the construction of structural mitigation and this option would necessitate mandatory buyouts of some properties and homes in order to accommodate. In some areas, the base of the berm, i.e. the footprint, would need to be approximately 90 feet, or sorry, yeah, 90 feet, 30 meters wide. As a result, some properties are directly impacted by the berm through existing structures falling within the berm alignment or the berm abutting their foundations. The latter presents a grading and drainage issue that could have significant impacts due to negative drainage. A very rough cost estimate between 118 to 159 million dollars, not including land acquisition, buyouts of homes, demolition and remediation costs, all of which would be necessary to accommodate the berm. This translates to roughly 1.96 to 2.65 million dollars per dwelling. It's important to note that the estimated costs were arrived at through a desktop analysis and the true costs could be much higher. As previously mentioned, the current and ongoing structural mitigation effort in our region was conceived to protect municipal assets. Presently, the municipality's existing assets in the community of Draper are limited to the roads and the signs. The timeline to design and construct structural mitigation will require continued support of council beyond this election cycle. And lastly, community-wide berms would not protect all homes in the community. There are some homes that would remain unprotected. In consideration of the above, administration does not recommend community-wide berms appreciating both the costs and the need for mandatory buyouts, as well as the fact that some homes will be left unprotected. Subcommunity and household berms. Administration examined the concept of subcommunity berms, which essentially looks at the feasibility of berms around clusters of residential properties. Likewise, a household berm seeks to protect individual uh, households. Through this assessment, administration has determined that the construction of subcommunity or household permanent and or temporary berms is highly variable and dependent on specific site conditions. 
Further, the success of this approach is fundamentally interconnected to the decision making of the residents themselves as it requires consensus on decision making. Structural mitigation at the household level and the sub-community level is not practical for the following reasons. Again, there is insufficient municipally owned land for construction of structural mitigation and this option would, would still necess necessitate mandatory buyouts of some properties and homes. While possible through an easement, it is contradictory to best practice to place municipal infrastructure on private property. This option would necessitate property owners formally providing rights to the municipality, allowing access to their property for design, construction and continued maintenance. This access must be maintained should the property be sold. This approach would not be available for all property owners. In some instances, multiple neighbours may need to approve the placement of a permanent or temporary structural mitigation. Engagement shows that there are different, differing opinions in the community and mutual approval may not be possible because landowners may not agree on the approach itself. In several cases, the household level mitigation could only fit if it encloses the residence alone rather than the entire property. Um, so if in effect, not uh, the structural mitigation would not go around the uh, perimeter of the property itself. In some instances, proximity of homes to property lines restricts the ability to build permanent or, structure or temporary structural mitigation. Vehicle access to the property could be limited during the river breakup. Ongoing seasonal temporary mitigation, such as triple dams, would be required to provide continuous protection around the property. Accessibility for residents and emergency services would need to be maintained. The associated costs would be would need to be considered on an annual basis. The large surface area of the berms will collect snow and rain. Consequently, the management of the associated drainage runoff within the berm protected area will be challenging and could introduce negative impacts, such as pooling of water or existing protected development experiencing unintended consequences. The costs are highly variable and contingent on the number and grouping of properties. Based on the community engagement that has occurred to date and appreciating the different views held by residents, administration does not recommend the approach of sub-community and household berms due to the incredibly high anticipated costs, the need for mandatory buyouts and consensus among residents. The last structural mitigation option that I'll cover is the, is the notion of raising homes. Raising homes could technically be an option considered but this approach must be confirmed on a case-by-case -case basis by a, by a professional such as a structural engineer. Further, the anticipated costs are largely unknown, but in most cases are expected to be at least half of the total value of the home. In some instances, the cost might be close to or exceed the assessed value of the property itself. Further, in some instances, homes might not be structurally capable of raising, or they might need to be raised several meters, thus making it an un unrealistic approach. The following are important considerations associated with the raising of homes. The additional elevation required necessitates for the underside of the main floor joist of the home to be above the 250.9 meter elevation. Based on our survey data, this means that the prospect of raising homes ranges from one centimeter to four meters. Four, four meters being uh, 13 feet roughly. The underside of the main floor joist was determined to be an important metric because it, because if they become inundated with water, the structure is largely compromised and generally would require a demolition. As a result, this approach will not be available for all property owners. Some property owners that are sitting for uh, roughly four meters uh, in change in elevation would not be able to accommodate the raising of the home. Actual costs will not be known until a case by case assessment by a registered professional has been completed. Determining the viability of raising homes and completing a property specific plan would be required to accurately outline not only the cost of the exercise, but also whether the, myth, the risks to either the property owner or the municipality by undertaking the work renders the process impractical. Raising is complex and inherently full of unknowns, which could include irreparable damage. The following consideration must, must be recognized as part of this process. Homes are varied in terms of um, design, foundation type, age, and condition. The potential presence of a basement is something that would need to be understood and reconciled. And the elevation of the main floor of the, and the property itself need to be considered. 
Lastly, resident displacement and household content storage would need to be addressed. There are significant differences between raising homes in the community of Draper as compared to what we recently completed in Ptarmigan Court. Homes in Ptarmigan Court were uniform, manufactured in a factory, constructed on a steel frame chassis, making them ideal candidates for such work. It is expected that this process will take a significant amount of time to raise the structure and residents will be displaced from their homes for several weeks or months. It is possible that household contents will need to be temporarily removed and stored for several weeks or months. The municipality would be expected to cover these expenses and accept, accept the liability during this period of time. It is expected that this approach may unfairly set expectations of residents as not everyone would be able to benefit from it. Based on all of the above, administration does not recommend the option of raising homes. In summary, structural mitigation is incredibly complex and will need to account for a variety of physical nuances with each respective property, the desires of the property owners, as well as the impacts from abutting property owners and the decisions that they make. This process must consider third party uncertainties and the fact that the financial costs cannot be precisely predicted for any of the structural mitigation options identified. It is important to note that some properties will simply not benefit from these options as mandatory buyouts would still be required to accommodate berms. In addition, some properties simply won't benefit from raising the home as the property elevation is far too low. Non-structural mitigation. Administration also reviewed non-structural mitigation options, which includes flood accommodation, voluntary buyout, and mandatory buyouts. The flood accommodation option is the recommended approach. It, recommend, it, sorry, it recognizes that flooding will continue to occur per periodically, with measures being taken to limit, mitigate, or reduce vulnerability to flood damage. This approach is multi-tiered, and it requires actions from administration, council, as well as the property owners. Ultimately, it helps clarify the roles and expectations related to future recovery while acknowledging that structural mitigation will not occur. To complement this approach, a household flood risk reduction grant could be offered, thereby allowing some residents to make property specific improvements to reduce property damage and post flood impacts, such as grading, raising of building utilities, spray and insulation, along with waterproof wiring as examples. Administration would recommend the following as part of this approach for Council's consideration. Land use planning considerations should be applied and may include develop area structure plan, plan policies that recognize the continued threat from future flood events, introduce responsible land use bylaw provisions that inform development, not dissimilar to the previous provisions that were in place prior to 2016. It's important to note that the planning tools will address future development, but will not account for existing development as it is today. In addition, this approach can limit additional municipal infrastructure, um, certainly continue maintenance of existing municipal infrastructure, work with residents to evaluate opportunities to improve existing service levels, and continue to work with the government of, our, of, of Alberta to prepare and to prepare for recovery activities in advance of the next flood event. The following would be recommended actions of Council. Continue to monitor and support the National Flood Insurance Strategy and Community Resiliency Advocacy resolutions that were adopted by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, also known as FCM, and the Alberta Municipalities, formerly known as AUMA. Support continued conversations related to the federal government's National Task Force on Flood Insurance Relocation. In addition, liaise with Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of Alberta to seek changes to the Disaster Recovery Program in the following ways. Seek to provide access to funds in advance of flooding events to proactively address community concerns. And additionally, advocate for funds for relocation of residents rather than building like for like in known hazard lands. This is not something that the current program contemplates. A household, a household flood risk reduction grant could seek to offer funds to incorporate flood resiliency at a household level. 
The goal is to address property specific concerns, thereby reducing the impacts and expedite recovery from future flood events. Examples could include, as I mentioned, relocation of the electrical panel, furnaces, hot water tanks, replacement of existing household finishing, finishes with flood resilient materials such as spray and insulation. I'm going to additionally protect storage, protect and store personal or valuable items. Administration could bring forward the grant program for Council's consideration on March 14th, 2023. I'd now like to cover voluntary buyouts. The municipality could purchase lands within the flood hazard area to keep private lands from being at risk of inundation from future flood events. Either a full buyout of the community or partial buyout comprising only lands below the 250.9 meter elevation could be considered. When assessing voluntary buyouts, the following needs to be contemplated. There is currently no funding available from other levels of government and the entire cost would need to be assumed by the municipality. Resident uptake is largely dependent on the individual financial situation. Property specific risks such as contamination needs to be assessed as part of the eligibility criteria. This option would require rezoning of all acquired lands to prohibit any further development and lastly, residents could leave the region as the style of community is incredibly unique. I'll now cover mandatory buyouts. The municipality could purchase all lands, all private lands, sorry, within the flood hazard area to keep them from being at risk of inundation from future flood events. When considering mandatory buyouts, the following needs to be taken into account. There is currently no funding available from other levels of government. And once again, the, the entire cost of this would need to be assumed by the municipality. Direction would, be, would need to be, requ uh, would be required regarding eligibility criteria to determine which properties should be considered. This option could provide a full elimination of flood risk. We would need to assess and understand property specific risks such as contamination, and that would have to be um, factored into uh, the process itself. Resident, residents could leave the region uh, once again as this style of community is entirely unique in our, across our entire region. There's nowhere else that you're gonna get proximity to the urban service area, access to water, and have that large estate style living. There's a legislative process for mandatory buyouts that allows residents to appeal the offered price using a third party. Actual costs including contamination, demolition, legal fees are unknown. It's expected that legal fees could continue as part of the process, especially in the event of an appeal. Acquired lands would be restricted to prohibit further development. The flood accommodation option is the recommended approach for the following reasons. It provides clarity to residents moving forward. It allows for the opportunity for an adjusted municipal response should other levels of government come to the table. It does require an altered municipal approach with respect to future infrastructure investment. It also encourages responsible future private development and considers future flood events. Voluntary buyouts would increase community resiliency, albeit incrementally. However, wide take up is not anticipated as assessed values would be lower than what residents would likely be willing to accept. And other levels of government have indicated that they do not have funding sources to support this approach. With respect to mandatory buyouts, this option offers the greatest long-term community resiliency, yet costs are expected to be higher than simply the assessed value and include other costs associated with demolition, remediation, legal fees, and additional remuneration if awarded by the Land and Property Rights Tribunal. This option is not seen as being fiscally responsible if, as the Government of Alberta has stated, all costs are to be borne exclusively by the municipality. In closing, considering the impracticalities associated with structural and non-structural mitigation options as summarized above, the flood accommodation option is the most reasonable approach for the following reasons. It will provide a degree of certainty and clarity for residents who have been waiting for an outcome on this, on this, on this discussion. It is consistent with fiscal the fiscal management value within Council's 2022 to 2025 strategic plan. While other levels of government have indicated that there is currently no funding, Council can continue to advocate for funding. In order to achieve the five to one tax ratio, the municipality cannot take on the roles of other levels of government. 
While administration does not have firm estimated costs on other options, previous experience shows that these will almost certainly be cost prohibitive. Other options require some regulatory approval, such as Water Act approval, as I mentioned, and the possible government intervention, neither of which will, will provide any certainty to residents. If other levels of government offer programs in the future related to flood events and recovery, the municipality would be positioned to quickly consider an adjusted approach. That concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Kelly. Do you have any questions of council? <coughs> Councillor Weigel. Thank you to the mayor and thank you for the presentation, uh, um, Kelly and Brad. I know your teams have put a massive amount of time in this, gone through and, and uh, really looked at this. So I, I do appreciate all the time uh, gone into it. Uh, I do have a bunch of questions. I'll start off and then I'll probably jump in at the end there. Uh, you talked about the, um, uh, with the flood accommodation and the grant program. Can you get into more specifics? I know we talked about moving the um, uh, you know the hot water tank, the furnace, and everything. What have you guys gone into more of an expansion of what that actually looks like? Through the chair to Councillor Weigel, uh, at this time we've taken the opportunity to review what a potential grant program could look like across various departments within the organization. We're confident in our ability to meet a timeline of March 14th based on past experience in developing the grant programs. What we've looked at is we've done an assessment across Canada where there's been similar programs that have been completed. We've reviewed those. We've uh, reviewed their findings after they've completed delivering those programs. And then we've looked beyond Canada at other parts of the world that have considered these types of programs. And so the idea is that you could look at three categories, so that relocation, separation, um, and raising of electrical or hot, hot water tanks. So those are kind of larger household adjustments that could be considered, recognizing not all households would be comfortable doing so. Uh, we looked at two other categories that could be considered as well, so that adjustment of household finishing. So that would allow people to look at um, you could um, put in different household finishings that would be more flood resilient. These types of approaches have been used in other parts of Canada, namely uh, following the Calgary flood. It was a recommendation to do things along those lines. And then the third is that protection of personal assets. So um, consideration for storage. So things like shelving and um, creating space within your property or even considering storage of, of items in other uh, parts of the region that would ensure that those um, personal family memories are as protected as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, in 2020, uh, after the floods, you guys came forward with a, the administration came forward with a voluntary buyout recommendation that at the council at the time then turned down. Um, uh, it is my assumption, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the reason that that is not now where you're at is because of the funding from um, the federal government and the Alberta government. Um, uh, I guess that their changes to the disaster relief program. Through the chair to Councillor Weigel, that's correct. Uh, July 14th, 2020, uh, I delivered a presentation to Council and, and to the community um, whereby we did make that recommendation. The recommendation was a voluntary buyout to remove uh, as many people out of harm's way and increase resiliency to the maximum um, that we could. Um, immediately after natural disasters, uh, there's a very short window in which you can um, have, I think, productive dialogue with other levels of government uh, to secure funding. Um, we had that window um, for a period of time, but uh, it quickly lapsed. So um, um, that's kind of the challenge. And, and now, um, you know, the province and the federal government have indicated very quite clearly to us that there isn't funding available. So it would uh, be uh, the municipality's responsibility now, that, uh, you know, should that be the, the path forward to take on all of those expenses. So thank you, Brad. Uh, I, and uh, so I'm correct in, in in saying that it's it's a funding issue more than if you had if all the funding was at the table, your guys' recommendation would be to then go back to voluntary buyout as recommended in 2020. Through the chair to Councillor Weigel, what I would I've got one part that I'll respond to, and then I'll allow Brad to to fold in. Is what I would say is with the recommended approach of flood accommodation we would still have the opportunity to participate in a voluntary buyout should the government come back 
in a different way with funding or with programs that are available. Flood accommodation also requires that we as an administration continue to work with various levels of government to aim to best position us should another event come forward. So the idea would be to continue working with the DRP um, administrators within the government of Alberta to start to talk more pro proactively to ensure we're as well positioned as possible for future flood events. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Weigel. Um, uh, Kelly has touched on it. Uh, the only thing I guess that I would add in addition to what Kelly had mentioned is um, we lost. Cut me off. We lost <laughs> I think that uh, um, council certainly has an opportunity as well to work with other like-minded communities across the province. Um, I, I believe that there are some opportunities to make changes to the disaster recovery program. I think that wider support across the province would probably help steward that conversation as well. So that would be sort of what I would add in addition to what Kelly's added. Yeah, no, I, I entirely agree. And I, I know I've talked to the mayor and, and some of the other councillors and I, I, I do believe going uh, advocacy to the federal government and the and the Alberta government, no matter the DRP program, it's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when we'll be we'll be spending that money. And so we're advocating hard right now to, and we'll continue to, um, to be able to advocate that we can get that money up front because it will be paid in today's dollars versus tomorrow's dollars. Uh, the only difference is I think that no matter what would decision we do today or decision that we come forward with uh, as we go along this path, I think we'll advocate no matter what. And so I don't think it's flood, in my opinion, I don't think a flood accommodation uh, says that, you know, that's our only option to advocate. To me, no matter what we decide to go forward, we'll be advocating for this, this funding and, and the changes as we live in a, uh, uh, a highly risked area, whether it be fire or flood no matter what. Um, we, uh, let me just kind of go through here, sorry. Uh, we talked about um, uh, Draper being very different than downtown uh, Parmarine Court and waterways um, as it sits differently in infrastructure. Um, downtown, uh, I think, wavers back and forth and so I'll let that one reside on the side right now, but I, what, where is Draper different than Waterways and Tar Parman and Court where we decided to do buyouts, obviously the funding, but we talked about how it's, you know, critical infrastructure and other reasons why we would protect that area or, you know, include that and, and not Draper. What were some of those decisions with Waterways and Tarman and Court and not Draper? Through the Chair to Councillor Weigel, um, I would, I would uh, you know, um, I'd be happy to allow my one of my colleagues, Maureen, perhaps to to correct me if I'm wrong, um, with respect to structural mitigation. But my understanding with Tarmigan uh, Court specifically, structural mitigation could not be accommodated um, in a way in which uh, it wouldn't result in some form of mandatory buyout. Mm -hmm. um, in order to accommodate structural mitigation, there would have had to have been um, the removal of some residents to make way for the actual alignment of the the, the structural mitigation itself. Um, with respect to uh, waterways, um, they are protected. Uh, they will or will be protected once mm -hmm. structural mitigation is complete. Um, so I don't know if there's more on that end, but um, with respect to Tarmigan, there's there was just no way of, of protecting that that part of uh, the community. Okay. Yeah, it it was just in the it was in the the presentation. So I yes. just I wanted to bring that forward. Um, there's talk of, um, and again, these are all personal opinions and as we go through, uh, especially in this next one, um, there's talk of creating a baseline because the, the responsibility, the Alberta government's basically handed over the responsibility to residents and municipalities as we go forward. And I do agree with that in some of the conversation and, and definitely in some of your research that you've done here is that we're, we're setting a baseline going forward based on, um, on what we do. Uh, and I, I agree, there needs to be an idea of what disaster relief program looks like for municipalities as we move forward. I think it's also important though that we, um, we set out what we want the, the, the municipality to look like as a safe location to live. And I think that creating a path forward, I don't know if right now is what we're doing is we're setting precedent um, versus deciding what does it look like going forward? What is what do we what do we want the residents to look like? What is the understanding? We're dealing with decades, you know, and, and I know that the responsibility has just been turned over, but we have to take care of the, in my opinion, again, we have to take care of the residents that are here first. And so whether they're too close to the trees, because, 
you know, fire prevention or they're in a flood zone. I know there's a lot of conversation and uh, that becomes frustrating to me that people, you know, knew that they were living in a flood zone and so it, they bear that responsibility. And to some degree, I, I understand the conversation. I don't agree with it personally, only to the sheer fact that um, downtown is a flood zone. <laughs> I have a, I have personally have a business that's in a flood zone, and I knew it was. Um, and but yet, there's now a berm protecting it. And so, I think that we have some sort of an equitable responsibility across all places to make sure that if we learn that it's unsafe, to create a safe area. Responsibility will lie eventually on the resident, but if we're going to make it equitable, I think it needs to be equitable all the way, all the way through. We've done things with Farmer Court and Waterways. I know that we had a provincial uh, funding for that, but it is my understanding, and I, and I could be wrong on this, but Tarman Court, we went, we, we ponied up first, and then the Alberta government came to the table. So for me, this is a similar situation of, hey, we're ready to protect we're going to protect, and then we're going to go, and we're going to look for the money. We, I don't, I don't think this lies on us, but I think that it is the responsibility of taking care of our residents lies on us. And so, to me, I, I feel that's a very similar idea of what happened in Tarman Court. I know the difference is, is that the Alberta government said that, um, you know, they've now laid the responsibility over. So the difference is in the programming. But again, going going back and saying, hey, we're spending this money one way or another. Let's do it now. I think is a is a financially fiscal uh, advantageous way to both the federal and, and the Alberta government. And so for me, uh, that conversation, again, it's to me, it, it rings true to the same thing as we live in a forest. How did we not know that we we're gonna catch on fire? Sorry, Councillor Wago. Yes. Um, do you have a question in that or? Oh, sorry, no, nope. I, I guess that's debate. Um, can save that for debate yeah, and discussion later? Question. No, my apologies. Okay, no. Uh, no, I'm good for now, sorry. Okay, thank you, Councillor Wago. Councillor Ball. <laughs> thank you, through the chair. Um, I guess I'll ask a question. Uh, I'm trying to get a better idea of which homes are protected above and below one in 100. Um, looking at the maps, I know there's 16 dwellings. Um, the red and blue, I believe, are not protected to one in 100. How many homes would that be? The province mandates one in 100, not one in two. We don't need to read this second. We can get it after. I'll ask another question. Um, and then, of course, the next one would be how many are, are not protected to one in 200. So what's the difference between one and two? And, my, and leading into what Councillor Weigel was talking about, um, voluntary buyouts, uh, I don't see any number. I see all kinds of numbers on what it costs to build berms and things like that, but I don't see any numbers on what the cost is to voluntary buyouts. And have we got a number of residents that have said we would like a voluntary buyout and ones that have said we don't? I don't know what, honestly, I don't know what the community wants. There's nothing in here that tells me what the community would want versus what administration is recommending. Through the chair to Councillor Ball, um, I'll tr try to uh, tackle some elements of your second question while we look for the, the, okay. the mapping. Um, with respect to the voluntary buyouts and the associated costs, they are um, likewise with, I'll say, mandatory buyouts as well, they're largely unknown. Um, what we can say is that, uh, you know, we could start with assessed values. That's the process that uh, was employed in Tarmigan when we were looking at doing um, voluntary buyouts there. As well, it's a consistent approach across other jurisdictions that have looked to relocate uh, or offer, offer relocation for residents. Um, Typically, in Calgary, for example, assessed was, was the, the um, numbers that were used. Um, the challenge with respect to providing, um, uh, I'd say, a more fulsome response with respect to what the total cost could be is it's difficult to understand what the remediation costs are, what the uh, demolition costs will be. I believe, Kelly, you do have some of that information, but it's... Um, I'll say it's a desktop analysis, uh, so it may be plus or minus whatever numbers that we have. Through the chair to Councillor Ball, I'll compliment what Brad has shared, and I think one of your questions was, do we know what residents had requested, and, and what we've received as feedback is they don't know what their decision would be without knowing what a full program would look like, and understand what their individual household um, 
offer for lack of better word would look like. We do have the numbers for those that are um, the one in 100 that's looking at uh, is 10 properties. The one in 200 would be looking at 16. Uh, this is again based on main floor elevation, the survey that was completed. And so we do recognize that there um, would need to be further conversations with residents to confirm uh, their categories are in alignment with, the, with our, are in full agreement with that category. Okay, so just to clarify that, 10 are not protected to one in 100, 16 or 26 are not protected to one in 200. In total, it would be 16 for the one in 200. Okay, and we wouldn't do any voluntary buyouts or mandatory buyouts for anything above one in 200. Any type of a buyout program would be at the direction of council. Currently, administration isn't recommending that. However, we'd be prepared to walk through what those scenarios could look like. Okay, I'm just trying to understand it because if I, if I threw a ballpark number at $2 million per property, it's 32 million bucks versus so 160, we, I think I saw on the screen earlier. If we currently look at the total for the one in 200, so those properties, you'd be looking at a range, again, depending on which assessed value is identified to be utilized within the program and there are different um, changes in those values at a household level so we'd need to consider that there's not a uniformed one is more resident focused or one is more municipally fiscally responsible there are variations year to year that isn't consistent um, but if you were to look at that it would range from uh, sorry 11.4 million to 12.4 million specifically around just assessed value, not considering costs for security, demolition, uh, and staff time, as well as any environmental studies or assessments that need to be completed, recognizing that any environmental assessments or studies um, noted on the file could impact eligibility and would be noted on the file for the life of the property. Okay, well, appreciate it. thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ball. Um, just one more question as in line with what uh, Councillor Ball was mentioning. Uh, for voluntary buyouts, it's not a program where we say this is assessed value, this is what we're going to offer you, or we make an offer. Is there a process in place already from the government basically that shows you what the process is for a voluntary buyout? Uh, through the chair to the mayor. Um, I can't speak to whether or not there's a process in place at the provincial level. I would uh, argue that we would probably or I'd recommend that we probably follow the same process that we followed with respect to, to Tarmigan Court. Um, essentially the process that we followed there was the assessed value of the property. Again, Kelly, I think has explained that there are some, I'll say some nuances with respect to that. Um, but we would have those conversations with the residents. Um, I, I will add that, um, you know, in speaking with some members of the community, I understand that the assessed value is far lower than what they were anticipating um, or what they, you know, what they could accept. Um, you know, we, 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 we recognize that this was also an issue in, in Tarmigan. There were certainly people that wanted to enter into the program that simply, you know, couldn't afford to, to respectfully enter the program. It just, the numbers didn't work for them. Um, so it's, it's certainly a very personal and a, and a, and a tough conversation, um, but it's one that we would certainly, um, you know, have on a one-on-one -on -one basis with respect to the, the residents themselves that have expressed interest, but we would certainly follow the previous process that we had in place. All right, thank you, Brad. And so then if we would start out with the assessed value and then work from there and then possibly an appeal process from the resident if that wasn't, didn't work? Uh, through the chair to the mayor, no. There's uh, essentially um, the, the process that we followed in Tarmigan is this is your assessed value. Right. Um, does this work? Uh, there was, I will say there were some some allowances for minor things like legal fees and things like that. Um, I'd say some of the softer costs related to the program itself. Um, but essentially the assessed value is what we'd be, um, notwithstanding um, outcomes from council or decisions from council, um, that's what we'd recommend as being the approach. Perfect, thank you, Brad. Uh, Councilor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Bowman and to, through to the presenters. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I am just uh, was reading up on your current status and uh, I was just wondering if you can give, explain the recent changes to the Provincial Disaster Recovery Program.
threw the chair to Councillor Stroud. Uh, while I'm not an expert in disaster recovery programs, I can speak to the general adjustment that they've taken. So it's one where they've clearly identified that they are going to sit next to properties differently in the future. Previously, there was um, not a cap on how many times you could access the funds. They've introduced a cap indicating um, that you may that's limiting the number of opportunities to utilize the program. They've also adjusted it from a individual to a property specific, meaning that that DRP eligibility will transfer ownership. Um, so that's a different model than was used previously. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Strat, if I may just uh, add to Kelly's comments, um, you know, it's essentially a, a, a one and done, um, regardless of what the value is. So if a resident finds themselves in a situation where they need to take advantage of the disaster recovery program, um, it puts, you know, it, they need to reconcile whether or not they're going to enter into that program for um, a certain amount of money or whether or not there's a future flood event or a future disaster that might warrant um, greater use of the program. So um, regardless of how much you draw on disaster, on the disaster recovery program, once you've used it once, that's the, 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 the threshold, that's the limit. My understanding is there's still they're still allowed one future event. Is that correct? Through the okay, chair so. to Councillor Stroud, that is correct. Okay, so there, there is some uh, assurance on that. Uh, the other question I had was, can you explain why the province provided funding for Ptarmigan Court? Through the chair to Councillor Stroud, I can't... Um, explain why the, the province of Alberta um, decided to participate in that conversation um, and partner um, with our community and in, in offer, offer funding. Um, I certainly couldn't begin to, to explain beyond, you know, responding to Councillor Weigel's question, um, you know, what I understand anyways, why they're no longer, um, why there's funding no longer available, which is just, it's the, the programs have concluded They've closed, um, and so so there's no more funding available uh, through the province or the federal government. But I, I can't tell you why they decided to participate at the community level for Tarmigan. Yeah, so they just, in my understanding, is they would only provide for that one community. Is that correct, Tarmigan Court, rather than Draper or uh, Waterways? But mind you, Waterways. You had they have the berm, you know they have the flood mitigation, so you can't really con include that one. But uh, between Draper and Tarmigan, uh, through the chair of Councilor Stroud, I I would endeavor to maybe take that back, and we can look into it. Um, I wasn't part of those conversations, so I don't know specifically don't know. how that unfolded um, or what the rationale was for offering funding in in, in the case of Tarmigan. Um, okay. I'd be happy to t take it back and look into it and see if I can find more information, but I, I simply just, I, I can't answer your question. I'd be speculating. That's good. Thanks, Brad. Um, so in the engagement with the Draper residents, was there a consensus of possible options on a path forward? Through the chair to Councillor Stroud, my understanding is there wasn't consensus on a path forward. There was also... Um, uh, comments that indicated to make a decision and to determine what their consensus might look like. They needed additional details. Uh, I'd certainly welcome feedback from Nadia or Matthew if they've got additional details to share. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. That's, uh, that's correct through the chair to, um, to Councillor Stroud. Um, we didn't have any clear path forward indicated from residents, and certainly what we did here consistently is that we needed to have a decision because this decision was going to impact so many other decisions that they were waiting on, um, but we didn't have a consensus to know what path forward they, all residents that we spoke with would prefer. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stroud, and thank you, Nadia. Uh, Councillor Benjoko? Thank you, Mayor Bowman, and thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is uh, going to be relating to what some of my colleagues have asked. Uh, I was wondering if there will be, uh, you've answered some of the questions already, so I'm just gonna build on the alignment of the residents with whatever path 
forward, we agree, because you are asking us to approve uh, the flood accommodation option and then come forward with the risk re reduction uh, grant program. Um, so are we going to have a plan to proactively uh, engage the residents and get some an alignment? Otherwise, even if we approve this path forward, I don't know if the, the I mean, we still need to get the buy-in. Otherwise, we'll be doing uh, two before we do one, and then we'll still have to, to get that alignment. Sure, through the chair to Councillor Banjogo, um, two parts to that. So flood accommodation, uh, I guess one of the advantages is, is it gives a definitive response municipally how we're moving forward. Um, it also allows us to, to adjust should other levels of government come back in a different way. So additional programs, different consideration could be taken. Um, but it, it was put forward recognizing that there's a need for decision so that we can move forward on a number of other areas as well. Uh, the second piece related to the grant program, uh, we've had conversations with Nadia and her team around what it would look like to be able to seek input from residents. We also specifically put it as a second motion, which would allow for us to bring it back to council and present it publicly uh, so that again, there's that opportunity for resident uh, engagement and for guidance. Uh, and then again, for yourself as a council to review what that program would look like uh, and I would anticipate we'd bring a couple of versions of that so that you had options to look at um, for lack of better words a, a plug-and-play model that best meets the needs of residents uh, the intention of a grant program also is to uh, allow residents to access it in a way that works well for their household uh, we've talked a lot about how unique each of the properties are, and so we would look to build it in a way that would allow for the highest subscription and participation, um, while also allowing residents to decide what works best for their property. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if this is too early to ask, but I'm wondering, um, I'm just curious as to the um, formula. Will it be a percentage uh, of the total cost that a household will need, or will it be a figure? Uh, because 5,000 is a good grant depending on how much you need. So if you need 85,000, you get 2,000 grant. So I'm just wondering, or I don't know if those kind of factors are what you're looking at. Sure, through the chair to Councillor Banjoko. Uh, I'll try to answer that without getting too prescriptive um, because we are looking to seek feedback on what this looks like. Uh, I'll be very straightforward. I wouldn't expect us to be the 100% solution for some of the adjustments. Uh, the intent of the grant program wouldn't be to um, adjust the entire structure of the property or to make all household adjustments, mm -hmm. but rather start to better position households for future flood events. Um, as we've discussed the grant program across the departments, we've been intentional in, in wanting it to be as barrier-free as possible while, while still ensuring that we're mindful of the appropriate ways in which to release uh, municipal funds. And so we'd be looking at ways for it to be as accessible as possible, um, possibly even considering uh, mechanisms of where it could, certain portions uh, may be available with uh, a reduced application process, um, if that's helpful on your side. Okay, and uh, that's helpful, thank you. And finally, uh, do we have a benchmark of the successes of grant, uh, this grant program that has been done anywhere where we can uh, have some information? Through the chair to Councillor Ranjoko, we do have, um, I'm just gonna pull the information up quickly, but there are, I think, six different examples we were able to look at through Canada, as well as some programs outside of Canada where um, we have seen noticeable improvements for residents following um, flood events. But if you'll give me just one moment to pull that up. Sure. Give me just a moment. Maybe we'll go to the next while uh, I pull that. Uh, yes, we can. We can. You can uh, maybe certainly talk about that later uh, to save some time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Majoko. Yes, thank you. 
Councillor Weigel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, during the presentation, you guys said uh, that the um, the residents felt like uh, in one of the downsides of the voluntary buyout that the the number was going to come in lower than they expect. What number was presented to them to make them feel this way? Or what number was presented that made them feel this way? Not to uh, my apologies for the wording there. Through the chair to Councillor Weigel. Uh, we haven't had, at least I haven't been part of direct conversations with respect to a voluntary buyout specific to uh, any particular property. But what I, uh, what I, I guess perhaps what I didn't clearly articulate was in conversations with some of the residents referring to uh, our typical process and the process that is common across the province, which is assessed value, is, you know, they all have their, all the, all the residents have their assessments and they know what those numbers came in at. Right. And that approach um, is simply not not uh, you know an approach that they could accept financially okay no i appreciate that and so there was obviously benchmarking done on how other other uh, municipalities um decide buyout values whether it be assessed or appraised uh, through the chair to councillor weigel that's correct when we uh, embarked on the program in uh, tarmacan court that's uh, a process that we we undertook at that point in time okay and, and then in the package and i don't know if we talked about it i guess and it's the same question about the um, the lower than expected rate. Um, there was a conversation where the residents felt like we were um, negatively affecting the assessed value or since the flood in anticipation of a buyout. Have, what would, I guess, what would a resident do or what could we do to look at um, showing whether that, you know, I don't, I personally don't think there was a malicious intent uh, at all, but how, how could we show that to the residents that the value, the assessed value is the assessed value without the, again, the appeal process being possible. Through the chair to Councillor Weigel, um, I wouldn't be able to speak to how the assessments are developed. However, I could request that our colleagues uh, come forward and kind of and discuss that a bit further and share what the approach was. That is something we could certainly offer. In addition to that, we can as we look at each of the properties, there's an opportunity to look at what those assessments were over the year. And as I indicated earlier in response to Councillor Ball, um, that is part of what council gets to decide should you go down the avenue of a voluntary buyout. So you'd have the option to consider um, different years sure. uh, and evaluate what that looks like. We do have that information available where you can see the adjustment and, and the delta between. Uh, and that's something that could be considered is, is looking at what uh, may better position the residents. Awesome, I, I super appreciate that. And I, I do just wanna take a moment to recognize uh, Nadia Power and her team. I believe that she did an absolutely amazing job during all the engagements and the, and the team was very engaged in, and out there quite a bit. And so I do appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Weigel. Uh, Councillor Ball. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Uh, the grant program, can I just get a little, it, it mentions in here, eligible properties are we talking about those 16 or are we talking about all 60 through the chair to councillor ball it would be if council were direct us to move forward with a, a grant program i had spoken earlier to councillor banjoko and indicated that we could bring options to be considered so you could look at um, the different categories that would be available you may consider um, based on the three categories, there may be more eligible properties for one uh, stream of the grant, or you could look at the whole of uh, all properties. So we would present a couple of different options to allow for council to consider what that looks like, consider the overall financial impact to a grant program, um, but it, it can be adjusted and we've intentionally set ourselves up to allow for um, a, I guess an intentional program that would be res fiscally responsible while tr staying true to what the nature of it is, is to reduce risk for those that have uh, are within the flooded plain. And we would have that by March 14th. I, I, all the options for every resident, for every property. Okay, fair enough, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Councillor Weigel. Thanks to the mayor. Um, 
I think I got one more question, and then uh, we move on. What does a blended approach look like? Is it a possibility to do both, say, the flood accommodation for those that want a grant program? I know there's residents down there that are in the floodplain that uh, love Draper, have been Draper, some of them for generations, and would love the the flood accommodation, just some help. Uh, I also know other residents that would also like a voluntary buyout program that they're ready to move on. Uh, some of them have physically moved on and just own a residence there. Uh, is, is a blended approach uh, possible of putting uh, one, more than one option on the table? Through the chair to Councillor Weigel, uh, while our recommendation is uh, has been shared this evening, a flood mm -hmm. accommodation with the grant program, uh, we certainly can accommodate uh, a blended approach that's well within your guys' decision making. I would note that as we move through what blended approaches look like, we'll be mindful of what our resourcing looks like and, and wanting to be able to move through that as quickly as possible for residents, recognizing all of this uh, is time sensitive. So we'd wanna consider what that looks like as it's above and beyond what was already planned for within the organization from a, a resourcing standpoint. Agreed, okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Weigel. Are there any questions from Council? I'm not seeing any, so thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Brad. And right now we'll take a brief 10 minute recess for council and we'll be right back at 1026.
Thank you, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, I just want to legislative services. Do we have any delegates for this item? Thank you, Mayor Bowman. Through the chair, we have a number of registered delegates in attendance this evening. And I believe our first delegate is Brandon House. Brandon, if you're with us, you may come forward. Uh, sorry, Brandon, do you want to come to the mic, please? And just uh, for the record, just state your name. Anyone at all there, Brandon? Hey, so I'm Brandon House. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Um, so I sent out my questions earlier this week. Um, most of them were answered by Councillor Weigel. Uh, I missed the first part of the meeting. Um, so a couple questions that I never heard answers from was, uh, so but getting berms or building our own berms, clay stockpiling, is that even possible or is that not an option? I would have to direct that to um, Brad or Kelly. Through the chair to the presenter. Um, I think there's probably a couple of us that'll need to take this question. And so on our side, when we're looking at potential use of berms at a household level or sub-community level, the concerns or the considerations that have to be taken into um, planning uh, remain the same. So there'd need to be consideration for appropriate planning um, and approvals through Brad's department, but also ensuring that it's not having a negative impact to those properties surrounding yourself um, and so those things would need to be taken into consideration. And then with regards to having a stockpile of materials and considering um, the municipality potentially supporting that in some way, we'd need to explore that further. Um, could it technically be done? Likely, we'd need to understand what that pricing is and what type of a program that would be offering. So if council were to direct us to do so, we could consider uh, that style of program. We could also consider what it would look like to include um, costing for materials as part of the grant program potentially, but again, that's gonna be largely dependent on ensuring that those materials are used in a way that is um, designed to not cause impact to other properties and is still compliant with all municipal uh, planning requirements and permitting requirements. Thank you. Um, the other one is, so I know people are hauling in their own gravel to build up their properties, and then they're having struggles on getting haul permits quickly and contractors looking to dispose of their, you know, gravel somewhere and why not help people with free fill? Uh, is there any way that we could get that, like some sort of a fast track permitting system for that? Yeah, so what we can do, Brandon, is generally for present presenting, any presenter comes up, you have five minutes to present and any questions you have like that, we can direct administration to bring those answers back to you okay. following. And then the other one is you guys talking about uh, assessments and Draper being devalued uh, because of the negative uh, feedback or whatever. So myself and a couple of my neighbors have actually got together and done that so I can email everybody a copy of what we've done. We've done five years worth of property values and they all differentiate from every other community over the last five years throughout this municipality. Uh, so it kind of looks a little bit fishy, but that's all up to you guys to interpret on your own time. I can email it to whoever wants it. That's all I have. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, uh, just, just one second there, yeah. Brian, if you could just remain there if you have any questions from council. Do you have any questions from our councillors? Uh, Councillor Weigel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through the chair. I just want to say thank you for coming up and uh, and speaking. Uh, I know you've done a lot of background information, uh, information and studies on a lot of this. Um, and you've come up with a lot of side ideas of being able to how to get through it. Uh, I just want to say that I would love actually a copy of the tax assessments. And so if you yep. put that together, please send it to all uh, mayor and council. Yep, not a problem. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Weigel. Councilor Minjoko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to comment, uh, Mr. Brandy. I was expecting uh, a much older person <laughs> when I read your email. Yep. And uh, so I do appreciate that you could get involved Thank this you. much um, pretty early. Thank, Thank you. you. And thank you, Brent. Um, you're kind of my go-to person in, yes. in Draper. So thank you very much for everything you do for the community. Thank you. Thanks. 
And the next delegates we have are Tony Pichet and Tina Johnson. Again, just to remind you, Joseph, sorry, just to remind you there's five minutes to speak and if you just uh, start by just stating your name for the record and remain on topic in the flood mitigation. It's good to have moral support, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just for the record, uh, you got it. Yeah, just for the record, just state your name and then you can go ahead, Tina. Uh, Tina Joseph, uh, Draper Road resident. And Tony Pichet. Um, unfortunately for Draper area, it has been three years of flood mitigation talks with no results. We've gone from administration recommending buyouts, many town halls, one-on-one -on -one talks, grant programs that were supposed to happen but didn't, and now are being presented with flood accommodations, which we are hoping won't turn into intervals of 90-day updates. The flood accommodations that are being presented, such as electrical boxes, furnaces being moved, water-resistant materials, lifting of homes may help some, but not all residents. And um, what is very concerning is that part of these accommodations that administration is recommending come with enforcement of development restrictions. And we don't even know what those might be, but are assuming that they will hinder further development. Um, Ptarmigan Court had a voluntary buyout because administration had said it was impossible to build a berm. And even if they tried, it would be too costly. This same reason has been given to the Draper area, but yet we've been treated, or we have not received the same treatment we agree with all the berming that is happening in downtown and waterways, but we also know that our area is at greater risk because of it. In a healthy community, no resident should have to worry about overland flooding or being able to get insurance. The problem of flooding will not go away until everyone is protected or removed from the floodplain. And for that reason, we're asking to add voluntary buyouts for those that are at risk and have no other options. That's it. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Tony. Do you have any questions from council? Do we have any questions? No. no do we have any questions for you? <laughs> I know you have questions. <laughs> but uh, okay, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tina. And appreciate always everything you guys do for the community. And next we have uh, Brianne Chadalaki. And again, Brianne, just to remind you, you have five minutes to present um, and just say your name for the record. Hi, it's Brianne Shack Lady. I bought a home in Draper eight months before the flood, my husband and I. And on September 15th, 2020, RMWB administration recommended to offer buyouts in Draper for the safety of emergency service personnel in future flood events. The last council decided to ignore that recommendation from the 710 page agenda package. This was a mistake. The buyouts and grants have been held over our heads, uh, the heads of Draper residents for almost three years. It's cheaper in the long term to offer buyouts in Draper than to do the current water and sewer service program. The money saved alone from not having to put in extra pump stations at the lower properties would cover the cost of buyouts. The new term flood accommodation that is being used is an insult to Draper residents. The downtown and waterways berms have turned Draper into a flood basin for Fort McMurray. Future floods will now increase due to the berms. It is important for you to make an effort to put yourselves in our shoes of how our homes are at risk as well as the risk to emergency service personnel. Flood accommodation means doing nothing. I'm not, I realize there's a new grant program. Initially for the past three years, they've been talking about the grant program to, for helping to build berms and raise homes. And now it's a completely different program. This is the first time it's ever been mentioned to residents about uh, installing electrical or changing your electrical. Flood accommodation means the RMWB knowingly offers zero help to those at risk that the highest risk in Draper, even though those in Tarmigan Court were offered both the option of buyouts and raising homes, even though Tarmigan Court had lower risk. 
Upper Cliff and Water Raysville was also offered buyouts after the fire due to slope stability issues. And in Upper Cliff, the, um, the way that they did it was through individual, individual negotiation, not just off of the um, 20, off of the year assessment rate. They went to each house and assessed their mortgage and what the person could afford. There was individual negotiation for every property in Upper Cliff. We have money in reserves to offer buyouts and the amount spent will be more than saved when it comes to the, our, the water and sewer service program. Administration has not even taken into account the 38 vacant properties in Draper. Those owners would have to be allowed to develop their properties, would never be allowed to develop their properties if this motion went through and all the bylaws changed. No one on council or administration is thinking outside the box to solve the flooding and slope, slope, slope stability issues in Draper. Administration first recommended buyouts in 2020 and the same exact reasons for the previous recommendations still exist. The only reason that exists for not recommending buyouts is money, money that we have available in reserves and that will be saved in the long run. Imagine if you voted for buyouts, what could be done with this land? Hundreds of acres of waterfront and untouched land in Draper, which is only five minutes from downtown. This could be a huge asset to Fort McMurray. No one has even talked about what could be done with all of the land, the farmland and parkland. Biotes and Draper could be a huge step towards reconciliation to First Nations and Métis people. This land could be given back to the Indigenous communities for land-based learning. All of the small holdings land is already zoned for parkland uses. Seasonal and appropriate use of the land would be ideal for this purpose as opposed to residential uses. Please vote for voluntary buyouts. It's cheaper, it makes common sense, and this valuable riverfront land can be used for invaluable steps towards reconciliation and indigenous parklands and farmland. Thank you, Brianne. Do we have any questions for the presenter? I'm not seeing any, so thank you, Brianne. Uh, next, we have uh, Dino DeMartin. And just a reminder, Dino, uh, you have five minutes to present. And just state your name for the record, please. Dino DeMartin. I've been a member of uh, Draper Community now 15 years. Um, my main thing is when the, they talk about uh, mandatory buyouts. Um, I don't think that should be on the table whatsoever. I think it's voluntary or, you know, the, the, the blended program, whatever you choose to go with. But we, with the tax assessment, People are going to lose money. It's going to financially ruin people. Um, and a buyout's got to be at a decent cost. I mean, you know, with the interest rates as they are right now, uh, buying a new home isn't somebody my age is not really viable. Um, but basically, yeah, I just think get rid of the mandatory buyouts and we'll work on the voluntary or uh, program that they're setting up. But other than that, I'm okay. All right. Thank you, Dino. Do we have any questions for presenter, Councillor Weigel? Thank you, Dino, for coming up. I appreciate it, and I, I entirely agree with you. I think mandatory buyouts uh, shouldn't be on the table. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Dino. Uh, Mr. Brad Friesen, and just a reminder, Brad, you have five minutes to present, and just say your name for the record, please. Uh, Brad Friesen, and I'd basically, I guess, say the same as Dino. I mean, to me, um, obviously not mandatory, but uh, you know, where we're voluntary, where we're given options, I guess. So then each of us can make those decisions basically on our own. So that's about it. So. Thank you, Brad. Do you have any questions? Just want to, I'm not seeing any. You're good, Brad. Thank you. Uh, Shane Kidd. And again, Shane, just a reminder, you have five minutes to present. Just say your name for the record, please. Okay. There's a button here I push. Oh, it's already on. Hi, I'm Shane Kidd, a local member of Fort McMurray since 1977. I, uh, my concern is that mandatory buyout because I'm not going nowhere. I'd like to be buried on my property. And the second uh, is I have other properties in Draper and you talk about, uh, or what I heard is there's gonna be no development. And so I bought a five acre parcel of land right beside Brad's place for the, because uh, my daughters love it here, the, they were gonna go in here, so we've been working towards getting, adding dirt to it, having a root hole uh, plan, all that in place, and adding dirt to it, and we have been now for, I guess, four years or thereabouts. So, 
right now we're at a standstill, I think, uh, because of the economy, and we don't know where we're going. We'll just look around, like maybe down. You don't need to look too far to know that uh, things are kind of unstable. So we're not looking to rush into trying to build my daughter a house. She's right now living in waterways. But our plan was to sell the house in waterways, build a beautiful home there, and that's where she'd live. And I live farther down the road, and uh, my plan is not to leave as well. And I've been doing the same, more so than there. But uh, if this new bylaw comes into effect and we're not allowed to develop, geez, I'm out 150 grand on that parcel alone. So that wouldn't be very nice if somebody takes and buys a piece of land in this town that they were born and raised at, and then all of a sudden, because of a flood or a fire or somebody else is in council or whatever the case may be, take the right away from them being able to develop. <clears throat> I think that's about it. Thank you, Shane. Uh, do a question from council, Councillor Weigel. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and uh, my, uh, my question is for administration, just on clarity. It's my understanding that um, the the no development in Draper is based on the land. Uh, if we did voluntary buyouts, there would be no development on the land that we uh, we bought out or assumed. I guess I'm looking for the wrong right word, but uh, development on land that is already privately owned would still be okay. It would just be the land that we bought from residents. Is that correct? Through the chair to Councillor Weigel, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to clarify. Um, in my presentation, I had indicated that what we would be looking at reintroducing would be essentially something similar to the 2016 provisions in the bylaw, which uh, only sought to have responsible development. So, developing um, structures, namely the principal dwelling, on uh, or at a certain elevation. So, uh, I've heard many residents uh, describe bringing in fill and material like that. Uh, we'd certainly support that. With respect to prohibiting further development, you are uh, entirely correct. It was with respect to any properties that we would acquire as an organization, as, as, as a municipality, we would look to prohibit any further development um, and thereby reduce the risk of any uh, damage to future from future flood events. So uh, to be clear, um, our conversations thus far within planning and development have not looked at prohibiting, restricting, uh, development uh, outright it would uh, what we are looking at is to have informed responsible development not dissimilar from what was uh, in the bylaw in uh, 2016 prior to the fire awesome I hope that clears that up I apologize oh it's okay I just wanted clarity for you all right because I wasn't sure either yeah thank you uh, thank you very much thank you Shane uh, Victor Haas your pass okay thank you sir Steve you covered? Perfect. I'm going to have to pronounce your last name again. Yeah, I taught in Stoshos and Steve, so I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other questions on administration based on the delegates' uh, presentations? I'm not seeing any. Councillor Benjoko? Um, I'm just wondering if we can add a voluntary buyout to what administration can come back with in March. Yeah, I think we might have a motion ready. Do you have? Councillor Weigel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I move that the flood accommodation be approved as a flood mitigation option for Draper Community Draper and that administration bring forward a household flood risk reduction grant program for eligible properties within the community of Draper by March 14th, 2023. And that administration bring forward a voluntary buyout option for residents under the 1 in 200 flood uh, elevation for council consideration as well by March 14th, 2023. Thank you, Councillor Weigel. Can I have someone second that motion? Councillor Benjoko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I second the motion. Are there any other questions of council for administration?
uh, through the mayor, I just wanted uh, some clarification on uh, the motion in terms of the date for a voluntary bio program. Um, it's because it's uh, kind of new uh, to this meeting. Uh, we haven't really talked about the time frames. <clears throat> I think what uh, staff can commit to is bringing some options for that, that kind of program to uh, that March date. It may not be a fully formed program because we do need significantly more direction from council about <coughs> some of the criteria, but at least we can have a, a conversation about it at that point. Uh, we can bring some more information though on the grant program by that date. So just want, I just want to um, temper council's expectations about what would be brought forward at that March, March date. Uh, thank you, CEO uh, Thurkelson. Yeah, I, the spirit of the the spirit of the the motion is to obviously put both options on the table for residents. Um, the grant program that you guys have already, or I, sorry, that administration has already said that they were able to bring on March 14th, and then the voluntary uh, the buyout program. Uh, looking for just more of a an outline structure of of what that would look like. Um, the, uh, what that option looks like, um, and then a, a, a specific date when it could be achievable to start. Yeah, sorry, my, my rambling was effectively saying just what you said. Okay. Is that we, what we can bring forward for that March date in terms of the voluntary buyout program is I think some options about an approach and probably some of the criteria that we need council direction on, mm -hmm. um, but it would be a subsequent date for us to have a fully formed voluntary buyout program available for council to approve. I, I, I think I think that's, um, yeah, I think that's great. Uh, is there, a, I guess, is there, a, I know you, you can't put a specific date on this one because you guys have not gone away to look what the time frame, but is there an, an idea of, of a program like this where we would get it to residents to be able to start, would we say like early next this year, or sorry, late this year, just so I think the residents have an idea of when we might actually look at something like this. I just don't want them waiting another two, uh, through, three years. Through the chair, I, I think we can bring at least enough details for members of the community to have a sense. But again, uh, that March meeting will be key for council to give us some clear direction on the program and some of these, uh, some of these aspects of the program that, that we will need firm details on. Okay. Um, and at that time, we may be able to give council a more definitive uh, idea of a time frame for a specific the implementation of a of a volunteer buyout program subject to council's approvals okay thank you thank you Councilor Wargo. do you have any other questions or debate points from council okay. i'm not seeing any so i'll call for a vote all in favor and that's carried unanimously That's today's meeting. Thank you everyone for participating in the meeting. Marcy Cho, Kim Rescompton. Thank you and have a good night. <laughs>